From the megalithic blocks used in the construction of sites like Machu Picchu, Sacsayhuaman, Alente Tumbo, Cusco, Tiwanaku, and many other sites, to the anti-seismic vertical blocks used in the Lima pyramids, the world of architecture in ancient South America is vast and provides some of the best examples of lost knowledge in regards to ancient architecture and stonemasonry. In this video, I'm going to show you some of the most inexplicable ancient stonework found anywhere in the world, rivaling and even in some cases outshining ancient Egypt, as well as explain to you why so many speculate that some of the origins of ancient South America lie in a distant remote past some 12,000 plus years ago. And we will discuss if these theories have any merit or credibility. I'm also going to show you sites such as the Valley of Pyramids, which bear a striking resemblance to many sites in ancient Egypt. My name is Luke Caverns, and I'm an anthropologist who specializes in the early origins and gray areas of human past. And I try to take an objective, well-educated, and well-studied approach to any topic without immediately dismissing any new ideas. And today we're talking about the lost architects of South America, beginning with the giant megalithic structures found within the region once ruled by the Inca Empire. But very quickly, I want to remind you that I'm leading an expedition to the ancient Maya ruins of the Yucatan with my good friend NEXT through his company Adept Expeditions. The expedition will be March 17th through the 23rd, 2024, and we'll be visiting ancient Maya sites like Uxmal, Chichen Itza, Labna, Skichmuk, Ekbalam, and even Lolton cave. If you're interested in joining us and want more information, well then I'll leave a link in the description and in the comment section below. Out of all of the ancient sites in the world, the megalithic structures found in South America deemed as Inca architecture have proved to be some of the most enigmatic and inexplicable examples of ancient stone masonry anywhere in the world. So there are two styles of this finely cut mortarless stone masonry found at Inca sites one being imperial and the other being cyclopean. Now, imperial blocks are modestly sized, usually not exceeding what a typical man could pick up and carry by himself. Often made of granite, these blocks fit together precisely, but each block is individually crafted to sit perfectly against the blocks placed before it. Conventional wisdom would lead us to believe that such perfectly fit together blocks would have been made to predetermined specified dimensions and then perhaps hauled to the site from the quarry. But that isn't what we see. It appears that each block was individually crafted, likely on site to fit alongside the block placed before it. Furthermore, at some sites, the blocks seem to pillow or puff out on the exterior side. Between these blocks or bricks, we find the remnants of bronze clasps, which were poured into molds and melted into place, holding the bricks together. This same kind of brick binding by clasps can also be seen at Tiwanaku, but we'll get to that shortly. Now, cyclopean blocks are the most notorious of ancient Andean architecture and arguably the most impressive ancient stone blocks found anywhere in the ancient world. These are incredibly massive multi-ton stones. Crafted in odd shapes, these bricks are not only rectangular like we see with the imperial bricks. This block, for example, is found in the city of Cusco at the palace of Inca Roca. Here we see many, many differently sized and angled blocks, but one in particular is a granite block with 12 different sides, each perfectly fitted against the surrounding blocks so tightly that they have survived multiple city leveling earthquakes. And the blocks are in such odd shapes that it almost looks like they were once perfectly squared and then they were inflated and are now expanded, pressing out against one another. Now, let me be clear, I don't think this is how it was done, but their odd shapes certainly can give that kind of impression at first glance. Furthermore, this 12-sided stone and the surrounding stones are even complete with their own nubs. Now, these nubs or knobs in the blocks can't be easily explained. What's more, these nubs can also be found in ancient sites all around the world. Does this indicate an ancient connection between cultures across the planet? Certainly some believe so. But also perhaps it's a feat of ingenuity that multiple civilizations have discovered at different times that we just don't quite understand yet. The megalithic cyclopean stones can be found at significant Inca sites all over the region of the Four Quarters. This is the name given to the areas of the Andes at the time of Spanish contact. When the Inca, who had only been an empire for merely 150 years, had taken control of and united the lands of ancient Indian civilization. 
However, when the Spanish arrived in 1533, they asked the Inca in front of the temple Inca Roca how they built these structures, to which the Inca replied, they were already there. Spanish chroniclers in the Andean mountains never saw the construction of this imperial or cyclopean architecture take place, ever. This is why, to me, of all the ancient sites found throughout the world, and of all the sites that people point towards as being evidence of an ancient lost high culture or civilization, ancient Andean culture may be the best case for this theory. In Egypt, the pharaohs and royal families were vain, and of course took credit for the construction of each great monument they constructed by inscribing their names on them to be immortalized. But here in ancient Peru, we don't see that. The Inca said that these megalithic structures were already there, but again, we'll talk more about that later. Another mystery is that the anti-seismic architecture found throughout the Inca Empire, anti-seismic meaning earthquake proof, throughout and after the Spanish conquest, countless earthquakes have wrecked Spanish cities built across the Andes, but not a single ancient city has fallen. Even ancient Cusco, built nearly entirely out of solid mortarless granite, was attempted to be destroyed by the Spanish, but the Spanish couldn't bring the structures down, so they decided to build a new Spanish city on top of the ancient city. However, in 1650, an earthquake leveled the Spanish city, revealing the ancient city of Cusco still standing beneath. And then again in 1950, another earthquake leveled the modern city, revealing the ancient city still standing beneath it again. Over time, researchers began studying and trying to unravel the secrets of this architectural design that allowed these enormous structures to stay intact even during an earthquake. One thing that is immediately noticeable about the architecture at these sites is the consistent trapezoidal design. It can be found in the windows, floors, walls, and even the blocks themselves. This has been deemed as intended for the structure to lean in on itself and stay in place. Archaeo architects have discovered that these giant megalithic structures actually sit on a soft foundation of smaller rocks similar to rubble. And it allows during an earthquake for these massive megalithic structures that weigh thousands of tons to slowly roll and move around in place and then settle in together. Rather than at other ancient megalithic sites that we see throughout the ancient world where there is a solid foundation, an earthquake can cause that foundation to crack down the middle. And at that point it is irreparable and the structure is permanently jeopardized and damaged. However, in the ancient Inca world, again, they made soft, malleable foundations for these giant structures that allowed the structure itself to, in a sense, roll around during the earthquake and then settle back into place, which has allowed these ancient structures to last nearly forever. So from around 5000 to 2000 BC, we see the emergence of Andean civilizations and cities like Corral and Sechen Alto among many, many others. They constructed U-shaped plazas and sunken circular plazas. Unfortunately to the general public, these are largely unknown sites as even archaeologists are only recently becoming aware of these sites within the last two decades. It is thought that many of these ancient Peruvian cultures were destroyed by cataclysmic flooding called El Niños or La Niñas, leaving their cities in completely toppled ruins. However, this style of architecture incorporating U-shaped plazas and sunken circular plazas did inspire one of the most mysterious cultures of the ancient Indian world, the Chavin culture at Chavin de Hontar. Situated high in the Andes Mountains, Chavin de Hontar is an almost entirely unknown site of an unknown culture. It was discovered in 1919 by Peruvian archaeologist Julio Tio, just a few years after the discovery of Machu Picchu. However, due to the state of the ruins, it was clear that the city had not been inhabited in a much longer time than the Inca sites like Machu Picchu and Cusco had. Furthermore, shortly following the initial excavations, Tio proclaimed that the builders of Chavin de Hantar must have been the mother culture of Andean civilization. Now, as stated earlier, we do know that Chavin de Hantar is not the oldest city of ancient Peru. However, this city did seem to set the stage for the later greater Andean civilization as a whole, establishing the principles of religious authority that would be followed by all subsequent cultures of the region. So Chavin was built upon the architecture 
architectural principles of the even more ancient coastal cities of Peru that we spoke about before. It had both the U-shaped plazas and the sunken plazas, and perhaps the city was established by the survivors of the cataclysm that destroyed the previous earlier civilizations. And coming together higher into the mountains, they formed their own civilization incorporating both styles of architecture. However, Shavin was built in two different phases, the old temple phase between 1200 BC and 500 BC, and the new temple phase between 500 BC and 200 BC. But here's the mystery. Archaeological evidence of the residential sites indicate that during the Old Temple phase, Shavin's population was only around 500 people. How could such a massive complex have been built by what had to be a tiny civilization? The Old Temple they built is also U-shaped with a circular sunken plaza, just like in the even earlier architecture found on the Peruvian coast. Perhaps this is the evidence of the fact that the fledgling surviving population of the Peruvian coast following the cataclysmic event that wiped out their civilizations regathered further inland to the east high in the Andes Mountains with only a few dozen surviving families. It appears that Shavin is the rebirth of civilization in the ancient Andes, but now with a religious influence that came from outside the Andes. What exactly this mysterious influence is, is again a topic for another video, but even the construction and formation of the temple complexes are different now. They are bi-level, meaning they no longer have leveled, equal, flat tops. They're leveled down, but the interiors are all connected with winding, sometimes very tight passageways and corridors. Which is a mystery because almost all of the temples of the even more ancient Peruvian coast were almost entirely solid constructions with the temple on top but now we're seeing temples with extensive and elaborate interiors. And on top of that, these structures are built to such a degree of excellence and expertise that it seems that the influence came in from somewhere else. We don't see the gradual incline in architectural ability getting the Shavin people to this point. We also see the use of megalithic pillars and slabs used in the construction of Shavin's gateway. According to traditional archaeology, this was never seen before up to this point in ancient South America, and how they achieved this feat has never come close to being adequately explained. Indeed, it is eerily similar to the mysteries of megalithic construction at the Inca sites. And if we look at it through the traditional archaeological academic lens, Shavin de Hantar is very likely the mostly unknown origins of megalithic construction in the ancient Andean civilization there may be a possibility that this influence came in from somewhere else, perhaps somewhere to the east. Although a connection is not usually drawn between the civilization at Shavin de Hantar and Tiwanaku, there are some undeniably interesting similarities. Although the end of Shavin's civilization was likely somewhere around 200 BC and the beginning of Tiwanaku's culture began at the earliest dates somewhere around 100 AD, at least according to traditional archaeology, it seems that much of their cultural iconography, architecture, and even religion are very similar. Curiously though, the orthodox academic viewpoint is that Shavin de Hantar and Tiwanaku have no connection at all. However, myself and archaeologists like Dr. Ed Barnhart believe that there must be a connection here that has not been fully appreciated. Firstly, Tiwanaku culture also employs the construction of sunken U-shaped plazas, which in my mind undeniably comes from Shavin, who also took it from the even more ancient coastal civilizations. Secondly, Tiwanaku cultures are known for their standing monoliths in town centers. This is unique among the cultures around Lake Titicaca. But if you travel back to the area of Shavin, you will find the El Lanzon monolith deep within the temple's labyrinths. The Tio obelisk, and the Great Ramundi Stone also depict a very intricate design of a fanged deity gripping stalks of maize, meaning corn. This exact imagery may also, and in my mind, is very likely seen on the standing monolith in the center of Tiwanaku. However, Tiwanaku's architecture and stonemasonry work goes far beyond that of Shavin de Hantar. Scattered across Tiwanaku and Pumapunku, which is really just the extended ruins of Tiwanaku itself, are complex multi-ton andesite blocks carved into multi-layered, complex, and precise geometrical patterns. In its current state, the ruins look blown apart, in complete disarray, massive H-blocks scattered throughout the area with enormous stone gateways missing the palace or temple that they were once attached to. 
massive temple bases such as the Platforma Lytica, weighing over 130 metric tons, today are completely without the structure that once stood on top of it. It's as if these ruins were completely destroyed and thrown apart, strikingly similar to the state of Tanis, Egypt, whose ruins are also scattered in complete disarray. For years, archaeologists and architects were not able to make sense of the scattered and complete lack of arrangement among Tiwanaku's architecture. However, more recently, architects are starting to put together 3D renderings of what Tiwanaku's architecture may have looked like. And although the megalithic stones of the Inca regions are undoubtedly impressive, it seems that Tiwanaku's andesite palaces and temples exceed the detail-oriented grandeur of anything else in the New World. So I just want to touch on the Valley of Pyramids briefly. Honestly, there are so many sites and so many cultures and civilizations that existed along the Peruvian coastline's Valley of Pyramids. They definitely deserve their own video sometime in the future. So the Valley of Pyramids civilization began parallel and even before ancient Egypt, actually emerging just before the pyramids of Egypt were being built around 2650 BC. The Great Pyramids of Kural, built by the Kural Supe culture, began in remote antiquity approximately around 3300 BC along Peru's Norte Chico ancient coastline. Now just for comparison and chronology, this is about five to 600 years before Egypt's first pyramid was ever constructed according to traditional Egyptology. Again, here we see these circular sunken plazas that are later seen in Shavin de Hantar and Tiwanaku cultures. This is the very distant ancient origins of these architectural designs. Recent excavators claim that this is the single oldest urban center in in all of the Americas and potentially the entire world. Now, interestingly, these civilizations were destroyed by cataclysmic flooding from storms called El Ninos and La Niñas. Along with vicious earthquakes, these massive, seemingly apocalyptic floods wiped out these coastline cultures multiple times, forcing the very few survivors to flee to higher ground where it is believed they later began the Shavin and Tiwanaku cultures. Finally, we arrive in the Amazon. Surprisingly, as mysterious and notorious as the Amazon is for its legends of lost cities of gold, walled structures, and pyramids, we do not have an extensive confirmed record of ancient Amazonian architecture, or really anything as far as ancient humans go in the Amazon. The cultural record does indicate that ancient South American religion has its origins from somewhere deep within the Amazon, but scarce evidence points towards the concept that architectural ideas and construction come from the Amazon as well. Perhaps though, with Amazonian religion arriving in Chavin de Hantar around 1000 BC, along with the first evidence evidence of megalithic architecture also at Chavin de Hontar at the same time, perhaps the knowledge of quarrying, moving, and lifting stones of this magnitude does have its origins from somewhere deep within the Amazon at a location that has not been found. Certainly, it would match the stories told by Oriana and other Amazonian explorers who chronicled seeing ancient stone cities along the riverbanks deep within the jungle. For now though, we do have evidence of geometrically designed, astronomically aligned earthen sites on the outer edges of the Amazon. These are likely networks of small satellite villages along the peripherals of the greater Amazonian civilization that acted as large agricultural populations with raised causeways and platforms for cultivating crops. Many of these raised roads and causeways lead off in straight lines for miles and miles deeper into the jungle. However, dangers such as uncontacted tribes that still exist today, fertilant snakes, Africanized bees, falling trees, flooding, jaguars, wild boars, illegal loggers, and gold miners are all barriers of entry into the more remote areas of the Amazon. However, I personally find it very likely that a lost Stone Age civilization does exist somewhere within the central to southern areas of the Amazon where stone bedrock can be found. And I think that this is perhaps the origins of ancient South American religion and megalithic architecture. So inevitably, when you're discussing the enigmatic nature of the massive megalithic architecture found all throughout ancient South America, you're going to come across many different theories of who constructed these sites. Many times this involves the ancient nubs or knobs, perhaps this gets into geopolymer or a globe-spanning, globe-trotting 
ancient Atlantean civilization that existed at the end of the Ice Age around 12,500 years ago. Now, regardless of the time period, I do think that ancient South America is perhaps, of anywhere in the ancient world, the most compelling argument for the evidence of an ancient lost civilization that existed anywhere between 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 years ago, perhaps upwards of 10,000 years ago. This civilization would have had the ability to quarry, cut, and transport giant megalithic granite blocks to an extent that dwarfs any civilization anywhere in the ancient world. They had no access to beasts of burden such as ox, cattle, or horses in the same way that old world civilizations did. And they moved many of these blocks up mountains that are so steep that it's hard to just walk up the mountain. Furthermore, they also had knowledge of the wheel, but chose not to use it, which is a mystery in itself. Perhaps the environment is just not conducive to the usage of a wheel. Now, describing the granite blocks at sites that are attributed to the Inca Empire as enormous is certainly an understatement. Perhaps the only words that appropriately fit their size and weight would be colossal or megalithic. Many of these blocks weigh more than 125 tons apiece, and in some cases, they were transported from the side of their quarry through valleys, up mountainsides, and over rushing rivers to get to their destination. These granite blocks at times can stand well over six feet tall, two feet thick, and over six feet across. In fact, those measurements may be on the low end of some of these blocks. The means by which blocks of this magnitude were quarried, cut, and transported without the use of the wheel or beast of burden like horses or cattle has never been explained. Even the jointing of the granite blocks boasts a level of precision and skill beyond much of what we see even in ancient Egypt. These blocks are fit together so precisely that each block is its own individual size and shape fitted specifically to fit alongside its surrounding blocks to a degree that a human hair cannot be fit between the blocks. This has led to the speculation of a geopolymer theory where the blocks may have been like bags of concrete poured as a liquid and then hardened in place alongside the other blocks. Now, there is no evidence for this thus far and still just remains a theory. However, some archaeologists take a diagonal approach to this. Perhaps the blocks were not poured into place, but rather the ends were fused with ancient acids to meet each other. This may seem far-fetched, but both the Inca Empire and Tiwanaku culture built roads leading out far south into the Atacama Desert. For why, we don't know exactly. But new theories suggest that it was to mine incredibly powerful acid deposits found in the area. Deposits that are still being mined today by the Chilean, Peruvian, and Bolivian governments. The use of these acids would also align nicely with the local legends of the Tiwanaku peoples as to how their ancient buildings were built. This hasn't officially been studied, but some New World archaeologists suggest that the use of these incredibly strong natural acids infusing stones together may not be out of the question. Furthermore, the contrast in the types of Inca stonework brings out a plethora of questions. The lower interlocking and megalithic sections of buildings are incredibly impressive, requiring architectural and engineering techniques that even today still baffle architects. However, the upper portions of the same buildings are modest and rather easily achievable by many cultures across all of the ancient world. Each block can be carried by a single man and set into place by a single man, packing the voids with smaller stones and mortar. This is a very common architectural practice used across the entire ancient world and even today. This brings people to a reasonable assumption that the two forms of architecture must be from two different cultures, with the lower layers being from an older culture and the upper layers being from a more recent culture. And honestly, I don't have the evidence to refute that idea. When the Spanish conquered the Inca Empire, they destroyed anything of cultural significance and melted down all of the gold they found to send back to Spain. So, likely, if any irrefutable evidence existed linking the Incas directly to the construction of these megalithic sites, it was destroyed and burned in the early 1500s. Many theorists consider the Inca sites to be a part of a larger Earth-spanning network of ancient Atlantean civilization that may have existed as far back as 10,000 BC at the end of the late Pleistocene and the Younger Dryas. 
One piece of evidence for this idea are the many nubs or quote unquote knobs we see all across the ancient world that can also be seen in ancient Peru, Egypt, India, and many, many more places. These nubs or knobs as they've been called are honestly one of the strangest anomalies that I haven't seen a good academic explanation for. They are all so similar and such specific stone masonry features, it's difficult to ignore your common sense telling you that this technique might have been connected across cultures of the ancient world. There isn't a currently widely accepted theory as to what these knobs were used for. Now, I have a simple hunch that they may have been used for leveraging and lifting stones, although that might be easily refuted because they are not by any means found on every or even close to every block. And another perhaps more academically leaning explanation could be that many different cultures were able to teach themselves whatever architectural or engineering technique this is, which is a technique or purpose that we still haven't figured out today. I'm not exactly sure which of these possibilities is most likely. On some presumably Inca sites, the nubs seem to be more common and uniform, but in other sites, they're random. But they're always intentional, and I would say very likely functional. They beg for an explanation, of which I just haven't seen an adequate academic explanation for them. It's truly a mystery. And at these same sites where we find these nubs, all across the ancient world, you will also find blocks fitted together so well that you cannot pluck a hair from your head and stick it between the stones. And these are almost always granite blocks, I should add. Larger and heavier than the limestone blocks that comprise the majority of the construction of the pyramids in Egypt. Although many propose the idea of the possibility of geopolymer being used, I don't know that most theorists even subscribe to this idea as the evidence is almost entirely non-existent. However, credible archaeologists such as Dr. Ed Barnhart and some others suggest that perhaps natural acids south of the Inca Empire in the Atacama Desert, as stated earlier, may have been used to fuse the edges of blocks together. There are even places where it looks like the edges of blocks curve upward into the stone above. And some researchers wonder if this is evidence of granite fusing that just can't be proven thus far. But honestly, this video doesn't even cover the vastness and all of the mysteries surrounding the ancient architecture of South America, from its deserts to the mountaintops to deep in the jungles of the Amazon. I wish that there were more people out there discussing these great mysteries, and I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like, subscribe for more. Let me know that you'd like to see more of these types of videos. And again, I'm leading a tour with my good friend NEXT to the Maya ruins of the Yucatan, uh, Uxmal, Chichen Itza, and several other sites. That'll be March 17th through the 23rd of 2024. There's a link in the description and in the comment section below. For those of you who came over from Danny Jones podcast, I just want to say again, thank you so much, Danny, for having me on your show. I absolutely loved it. It was the very first time I ever did an in-studio, in-person podcast like that. I was a little bit nervous in the beginning, but I think we pulled through in the end. Uh, it was amazing. Thank you all so, so much for watching this video and supporting me on this journey. I'm Luke Caverns. If you like what I'm doing, all you have to do to help me out is like and subscribe for more. Thank you.